What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Philosophical Misfit Podcast. Today, I got my first ever guest on the podcast. I've been super stoked, super excited for this. Been a long time coming. Uh, his name is Matthew Palmer, aka Matt, um, and he is a Matt is a Master of Divinity student at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. His primary research studies are done in philosophical theology, so obviously a subject that we talk a lot about on this podcast and on my YouTube channel, and he studies in Pauline and Johannine studies. <laughs> I had to look up how to say that word and what exactly it was because he's so smart. He studies things that I can't even pronounce. Uh, there's the theories of violence and mimetic theory and transdisciplinary theology. He is a very intelligent, very smart individual that I am blessed to call a friend. And so, Matt, how you doing, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, I, I am so stoked for this, man. So, obviously, that is just a little bit about you and who you are and what you're doing. But why don't you go ahead and share a little bit more about, you know, just beyond that, like more in depth, what you've been studying, how long you've been doing it, what your plan is what you want to do with this you know all that good stuff so take totally it yeah. um so i have studied theology since my undergrad and also previously before that was interested in the subject i got really interested in it my say junior year of college when i started reading pretty in depth in various scholars and authors and just really was on this search to discover who this person Jesus was and is in my life. Um, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the person of Jesus and the way he lived his life, the, exa the example he set. So that really started my journey towards wanting to do more in-depth study, which led me to start a Master's of Divinity, um, which is a three and a half year program. Typically can take longer depending on if you're working in various social locations of people. But I have finished three years. I finish up this May and will graduate. My plans are if I get accepted to a PhD program, which I just finished applying to, I will head in that direction and do theological studies at the doctoral level. Awesome. So the School of Divinity, that's not just divinity talking about specifically Christianity, correct? Is that uh, like talk a bit more about the research in that? Totally. Uh, so typically, when people think of divinity schools, they actually are thinking of seminaries. And those are denominationally based. So you may have like a Baptist based seminary. What differentiates a seminary from a divinity school is in a divinity school, while it largely will be a Christian theological context, uh, there are multiple denominations present. You also can have atheists, agnostics, Muslim scholars, Jewish scholars, uh, basically anyone who wants to study the Christian tradition and theology in a broader context, that is a great place to go. And that's what one of the main reasons I chose Bright Divinity School is because of the diverse thoughts that were brought together and the diverse people and their backgrounds and how in that space you can do theology in a dialogue and have your assumptions challenged by different people's perspectives and the experiences they have. So that really is the difference between those two. Nice. Awesome. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is something that uh, we both have been doing. It's a huge part of my channel. It's a huge part of what I talk about. It's a huge part of the community on my channel, but it is all about deconstructing religion. Um, and so, you know, I guess we can start Let's let's just start with the story side of it on on how me and you met first off going back going all the way back in time years ago when we met how we met and then what has brought us back together so is that something you want to tell that story or uh, you just want me to share briefly it doesn't matter to me <laughs> you can give your side I can give my side yeah I mean so we both went to a uh, quote unquote ministry school, I guess you could quote unquote ministry school. Uh, and that is where we met at a uh, ministry school in Redding, California. And it was specifically on, we were doing a missions trip in England. And that was when I was still going to church every Sunday. That's when I was 
leading worship. That's when uh, I led worship like every night on that trip. And you even preached on that trip. You preached I did. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's where we met. And um, then, yeah, I mean, is there anything else that you want to add to that story? Yeah, I just remember that was like the second time I had gone through or first time I started going through a deconstruction process. So it was interesting being at a ministry school where they're teaching you things and at the same time having like opposing views come in and having to like dismantle things and rebuild things and just being in that liminal space uh, and then meeting you on the England trip and other friends that we have was a reinvigorating incredible uh, experience and encounter because we all just clicked so quickly and it was just such a rich friendship that I really didn't know if it was going to continue afterwards but has been a great friendship moving forward especially yeah. even though we had a break it brought us back together later on in such yeah. cool and rich ways yeah but the thing that brought us back together was more deconstruction which i find it interesting totally. that he's saying like you know you at that ministry school you were even deconstructing because deconstructing isn't something that just happens once really it's a you know it's a whole process of being and it's like you learn this and you deconstruct it you learn this and you deconstruct it so i think that's the first time that you've said that even when you were at uh in reading that you uh, were deconstructing there as well. Totally. Um, so I, at the same time I was doing that ministry school, I was doing an online sort of uh, biblical training school. And so that was the impetus to rebuild a new system was through that school. But at the same time, I was getting that training at the ministry school. So they were conflicting in various ways, um, cohering in various ways. So that kind of created this tension where I was deconstructing and also reconstructing at the same time. It was a very interesting experience. Hmm. But then after we got back from our ministry trip to London in England, we, I met a person on Facebook and who's become a great friend and mentor of mine. And he had started poking holes in the evangelical system, the fundamentalist theological system. And a bunch of charismatic Christians jumped on his Facebook page and started following and recognizing like the truths and what he was saying. He was doing it from a scholastic academic viewpoint. Well, then he turned his radar gun on the charismatic Christian group and their religious beliefs and started deconstructing the charismatic movement. And I, in a, as a person, just love the search for truth. I'm just like continually searching. And if something yeah. isn't yeah. helpful or going to promote the flourishing of human uh, humanity, then I'd like want to throw that out and move towards the flourishing of all people. And yeah. that's what he was doing. He was pointing out, these are, these are very destructive ideologies and thought patterns, and it doesn't look like Jesus. And we need to deconstruct this and reconstruct some new paradigms that are more helpful, more loving, uh, more justice focused and seeking the flourishing of everyone. So that was happening while you were at the ministry school that we met at? Yes. At the, yeah. That was towards the tail end of it. So that was even like the start of the second deconstruction that I like can pinpoint in time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really the same with me. I guess I started deconstructing a lot, even while I wouldn't, I didn't even have the language of deconstructing until we started talking again. I was like, that is a great way to put it. Um, and I guess we should back up just a little bit here. So when we say deconstructing, since, you know, I really heard the term from you and now I've been saying it ever since, cause I'm like, it's just a beautiful <laughs> term to use. What exactly is deconstructing when it comes to religion and religious thinking? Yeah, that's actually a great question because when I first going, started going through the process, I came upon the word deconstruction, didn't know anything about it, but felt it describe my process very well. Um, so the term actually comes from a French scholar named Jacques Derrida, and Derrida was a part of this group called the Deconstructionist. And this group looked at the way that language and, I, and ideas are all deconstructible, even within their own system of thought and words play off of words and are in opposites. But the point of deconstruction is actually that everything can be deconstructed, which means 
it can be reconstructed and deconstructed. So it has a positive and an, like a destructive element and a positive rebuilding element. Mm -hmm. That word got popularized without the background of Derrida's system. And so people will say deconstruction and oftentimes they mean the, this destruction of, of all their beliefs and they don't know what to do and there isn't this positive reconstructive element involved. So you said so the, many people and recently you said the destruction of all of their beliefs. Yeah. So like once something in their faith system falls apart and they start to question, say, well, I don't know about the existence of God. It kind of creates this chain reaction where all these other beliefs start to crumble. And that is described as a deconstruction, but there isn't that element of like, well, how do I then reconstruct? Mm -hmm. And that word itself, when Derrida and the deconstructionists are using it, it already has the element of a reconstruction since everything can be deconstructed. It can be reconstructed. Mm. And so in that sense, many people are like, oh, I'm going through faith deconstruction, which sounds more of like a total destruction of their beliefs. And they don't know where like anything is to hold on to. Yeah. And so the metaphor itself can be problematic if it's not anchored in the reality that since I've deconstructed this belief, I don't just need to like go off into, oh, nothing's believable. It's all just for naught. But rather, I can hold on to some things in attention and rebuild, deconstruct, rebuild, deconstruct in that pattern. Yeah. So I like to think of like other metaphors as well. Uh, some good ones are like, you're, re you're renovating a house. So, oh, this room, I don't like the paint color anymore. I'm going to repaint it. I'm going to tear down this wall, make the space more open. And that's a good metaphor for the faith deconstruction is you're not tearing down the whole house, just getting rid of it, but rather these elements that are unhelpful, we can change in ways that are more gracious and kind to our, our way of being in this faith tradition or any tradition at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that often I've heard from people when they're talking about their deconstruction is it's more of a like leveling of everything. And then they're just left sitting on like the foundation of the concrete of their house. And they're like, what do I do now? Like, I don't know what to believe. How do I believe anything? But rather finding a way to go through the process in which not everything needs to just be tossed out, but yeah. we can do things in a constructive manner that's helpful, that is moving forward because some beliefs are damaging and don't, fit with the reality that we live in, the suffering, the pain, the violence, but rather we can look at new ways of seeing the world. We can take off that like old decoration and put up new decoration that fits with the world that we're living in. Yeah. So let, um, just not wanting to interrupt you, but just something that I keep thinking about is the whole, like the people that when they hear deconstruction of religion that are totally like, I need to absolutely deconstruct everything and then you're just left with the bare bones now there's so much uh it, obviously this leads to a whole bunch of controversy because i think that the most of the people and i could be wrong about this um but that go like with a complete deconstruction and don't reconstruct anything typically will turn into atheists or of an a more atheistic thinking um and so then that gets into well, you know, what is, what is truth? Because really what we're talking about here is the supernatural. We're talking about things that we can't, that aren't tangible to us. And so how, how is it possible for us to deconstruct something that, you know, we can't see or hear, or, you know, it's like pretty much non-existent, but it's just kind of been like, we've, we've seen now, oh, this is kind of like a fairy tale that I've lived by my whole life. How, how do people go about reconstructing that in a way that they know it's truth, you know, rather than just like ending it all at like, I'm a materialist, deterministic, atheist, like how do people, you know, like obviously some end up there and then they're like, well, I think that this is the truth, but how can somebody deconstruct religion and then reconstruct it to be, oh, this is still, there could, still could be validity in this, you know? So what, what are your thoughts on that? Totally. I think it all is very personal and, so each person's journey is not going to be the same. I think the way I've gone through deconstruction has looked differently at different times. Like early on, I very much was like, I'm deconstructing every single idea down to the bare bones. I don't even know if there's going to be anything left. But ultimately, I found for myself, 
that when I did that, I was left with this experience, this reality, whatever you want to call it, this like love at the bottom of everything that no matter what I came to this conclusion, this realization that at the bottom of everything is this love that's holding me and I am assured and I can trust in this holding in reality. So you, and that kind, of, ultimate, you kind of, deconstru- you kind of deconstructed to a point of more so agnosticism than atheism. Totally. Am I here? Am I hearing that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You could put it in that way. I think mm-hmm. it was, I deconstructed all of these beliefs and ultimately I was still fascinated by Jesus because of the way he challenged my way of being in the world. Um, yeah. his, the way he advocated for the marginalized, he act, acted out in ways that were contrary to the social, um, this way the social system was set up and brought people in that were excluded. So I was always fascinated by that, wanted to live in that way. Yeah. But ultimately all of, oh, go ahead. No, yeah. I was just going to say, cause I, I, I'll tell people, you know, on my channel that uh, they bring up the Bible and is there truth in the Bible? And I'm like, well, whether, you, whether or not you believe that Jesus was a fictional character or actual historical character, which I'm sure we might get into that. Um, I'm like the thing, how Jesus lived his life. If everyone were to live like that, the world would be a better place. So there is truth there in that. So that's, I just, you know, my two cents in that, but completely oh, agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And really the mentor of mine, he has this phrase that um, is stated at Calvary, all God concepts die. Yeah. I like and that so a lot. When you're staring at the cross, you're looking at, a Jewish Galilean man from Nazareth crucified by the Roman empire and dead on a cross. And so your idea of God or your conception of God that swoops in and saves the day or that manipulates reality for some and doesn't do it for other in supernatural or charismatic ways, all of these conceptions that we try to create about God, these idols, they all die when you're staring up at this, dead jewish man and at first and for a lot of people that feels like god is dying it feels like god himself died totally and you even have the entire movement of the death of god movement and now you have the post death of god movement where people are doing theology after the death of god when all of these metaphysical ideas about god or these conceptions of god as like the savior who swoops in um after all those have died, how do we still do theology? And there have been some great scholars that are doing very constructive and philosophical and theological work in that movement. Um, specifically, John Caputo is one of my favorites. Uh, Catherine Keller up at Drew University is a great constructive theologian. And so, so they're doing... Oh, these ahead. are, these are uh, people that, like, they, they... Explain it a little bit more for me. Like, God... They say God has died, but yet they're still doing fo- like, is it just a metaphorical God has died based on, you know, the, the ideology that we created in our head has died or is it something other than that? I, I, I haven't heard that term or about that movement before until now. So I'm just curious. Yeah. So it was a, um, it was famous for a short period of time and then it kind of fell off uh, the wayside um, scholastically that is, but it was, You get this movement after post-Holocaust. The Holocaust really put into question any ideas of this God that comes in and saves the day. And we're really left without God in our suffering. Hmm. And so how do we contend with the horrors of the Holocaust, um, the horrors and disasters of um, entire peoples being wiped out and religion being at the core of that or a piece of that? And when we look at that, how do you construct a God concept that can relate to the suffering of people going through that or even speak to that in any constructive way and so that's kind of like one impetus of where they're drawing from is they're saying we can't do theology like we have been doing it because it leads to things like the holocaust or it leads to the exclusion of people in society that should be included based off some stupid social construction Hmm. and so they're trying to rethink theology after we no longer have this conception of God as this savior, this person who works in an economy of exchange where if you give God prayers, God will bless you. Um, 
So with that, the theologians who are doing theology after the death of God, they say that God tells them that God is dead. And so it's this paradoxical idea that it's God saying that God is dead. This reality that is God that's saying this is this, in a sense, like a haunting specter that is always wooing us and inviting us and keeping us up at night. It's this groundless being that's below the ground of being. It's all these metaphors that are trying to use to describe this like thing that we feel in our bones exist and is this some sort of reality, but we don't want to put it in this metaphysical system of thought or we don't want to try to idolize it. So but really, it's, So it's like trying to, doing theology or, or I guess researching theology to how does this it work out coherently but coherently with you know whether what scriptures say or what we understand you know our god concept to be with the sufferings of the world and how you know because oftentimes that's a question that you know people ask is it's like if god existed why is there suffering why is there why are people dying what you know why did the holocaust happen why why did all of that happen so it's really uh, if i understand what you're saying correctly it's like trying to uh like like figure out how they work together and how they cohere together yeah very Got much it. so it's uh yeah. yeah dealing with the suffering and violence and horrors of our history and our lived experiences um today and in the past and how do we cohere that with any sort of conception of god or religion gotcha gotcha um yeah and i, I mean among these deconstructing process. I mean, I know I interrupted you. I didn't know if you were, wanted to finish a thought that you were saying or keep going down that. I, I mean, yeah. So did you want to keep going? I, I realized I interrupted you. Uh, well, I can talk about how, so in a similar way that those theologians are working through the violence and destruction in this world and how we create a coherent system of theology or anything like that. That's very much what happens in deconstruction is there's a term, there's two terms. One's called your embedded theology and then deliberative theology. Mm. And those two terms, so your embedded theology is basically if you grew up in a religious environment or even just in, say, the North American Christian context where Christianity is largely becoming post Christian society, but really is still in the air where you're picking up these ideas or thoughts about what this Christian system is just from the social cultural system that we live in. That, that may be something that you're implicitly getting and is embedded in your system of theology. Um, if you grow up in a strictly religious setting, it's coming from the prayers people are praying on Sundays. It's the sermons. It's all of the theology you're picking up there. And that really sets you up early in life. But eventually you come to some point where either in a conversation, uh, a crisis in your own life or the loss of a family member or friend or close loved one, some crisis occurs that puts into question your embedded theology, the presuppositions that you have. And that can be chosen. So some people can choose to go through that process of deconstruction and say, I don't really know about this idea in my system of thought. I, it's not cohering with my reality or what I see in the world. And they can journey through that deconstruction and seek out how to work in that in a deliberative way. Others, it happens to them with, say, the loss of a family member, or close loved one. How do I reckon with the death and seemingly unfair or totally out of nowhere accidental happening? How do I deal with that? And then this system of God that I've been taught that tells me that God saves the day or swoops in or can heal my my a family member who has cancer and doesn't, how do we then reckon with our theological system and our lived experience? And that's where deliberative theology comes in, is you're deliberating, you're asking questions about those presuppositions and trying to construct a faithful um, rendering of theology that is faithful to our experience and to the complexities of our lived life. Hmm. So how would, some, I mean, so I totally hear the like, embedded theology and then like deliberative like this is things that i'm going to change and i would say for me 
based off of my story, it was definitely, I started my reconstruction, uh, deconstruction, and I guess reconstruction in some way process from the latter of like, you know, a very traumatic event. And then, you know, it just kind of like all hit me at once of like, I don't think I believe in God and what the hell is happening. You know, all of that. So I, a part of the journey for me, um, and I'm sure for you as well has been like, I, I knew I needed to learn, you know, what's, what's the right way of thinking or what's the, what's the truth in this matter. But for me, the issue was, and really still is like, how, like, what are even the things that I need to deconstruct and how do I even go about doing that? Like, you know, I mean, there's, I, there's so many people all the time that will come to me saying, what do you think about this? What do you think about what this, or what's your opinion on this? And it's just like, they simply don't even know how, because of that embedded theology that it's like, this is, you know, they were grown up and taught, uh, you know, like the, like the theology or the teaching of hell. Like when you look in the Bible and try to like logically think about it, who God is and how, you know, and hell and all that, it's like, it doesn't make logical coherent sense, but to, you know, a fundamentalist Christian, it does just because it's been embedded in them. And so, you know, once this whole thing hits them of like, I don't, I'm not sure what I believe, you know, the whole deconstruction and reconstruction process for me, it was figuring like, I didn't even know, that I needed to ask the question about hell. I didn't even know that I needed to ask the question about pain and suffering until those things came to me. So what would you say, what would you say to people that are like, how do I even start this process? Like, you know, if they want to start this process and I guess not only how, but what's, what's the benefit of deconstruction and reconstruction, you know, like practically and all that. So I'm sure you have a lot to say about all that. <laughs> but, yeah, no, those yeah. are great questions. Uh, I think, for anyone who is looking to go through the process of deconstruction, I think my number one thing I would say based off how I have helped people or guide, guided people in the past through a process of deconstruction, early on I did it in a very unhelpful way in a sense that when I would meet with people, I would try to give them as much information as I could and try to deconstruct as many beliefs as I could in our like short little meeting and then I ultimately left them with just the deconstruction of their beliefs and nowhere to go from there mm. and I think that can be very uh painful and very hard to go through I think yeah. many people may not even choose that but have that happen anyway yeah just by experiences they have so I'd say first of all be kind to yourself um be okay with tension and development and growth and really see that this is a long journey and we're never going to arrive. There isn't like a destination we're trying to get to, but rather it's this dialogue and really trying to develop a theological system that coheres with ourself and what we feel is integrous to ourself and what we think about the world and how we should live in it. And then also how it coheres with the suffering, the violence in the world. So that'd be the first thing is saying, you know, if you're going to go on this journey or have started it, realize that it is a journey. Like I'm still on the journey. I'm still learning. I've read tons of books and yet I don't have all the answers. I think I just have more questions and I'm okay with that because I've recognized that I'm not going to arrive anywhere and it's not the point of the journey. So I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, so, like, where is the, what, what would you say is the hope in deconstruction? Like, I think that's what I'm talking about with the, like, why should people deconstruct? Because it's like, well, if I'm going to deconstructing, deconstruct something that I feel is set in stone and I'm comfortable with this, why would I go through a deconstruction process? Um, and where's the, where's the hope in that? Because obviously, you know, I, nobody's really arrived in life. Um, but you know, that's, that's, you know, a, a contradictory thing to say that you've arrived somewhere. Um, it's like, yeah, but, um, like where would be the hope in, um, you know, just simply asking, cause that can seem very, you know, well, are, am I just going to keep asking questions for my entire life? Am I ever going to be grounded in anything? You know, so where, like, what's, what's the point, you know, where's the hope in it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so 
with that whole first thing I said set up, the next thing is that in the process of deconstruction, the point of it is either you're going through it intentionally or it's happening to you. And so how do you go about that is you're going to look for resources. You're going to start thinking through the consequences of my belief. So no belief is just simply pure belief with no ramifications, but how we think about God, how we think about God's relationship to human beings is ultimately a relational and ethical thought process because the way we think about those things is how we're going to enact policies, how we're going to interact with our neighbors, how we're going to interact with the suffering in the world. So I think once you begin to see how your theology affects other people, and you can see it in the United States politics right now, we have a very fundamentalist evangelical system at the top of our political system. And you can see how those beliefs are affecting the policies and the way the nation is looking to be governed and run. So looking at the ramifications of belief is one way of the hope is in, I'm going to develop better theology in the sense of it's going to be aimed at the flourishing and the love of all people around the world. And in order to do that, you have to take account of the complexity of the world. You have to take account of the situation that people find themselves in. Yeah. So I think that was for me, the hope was, I'm getting rid of these beliefs that I'm finding very problematic because I can see how they're damaging and they're harmful and they aren't, they don't look like the person of Jesus in the way he lived his life. And that was for me, the hope was that I can create a system of belief and continue to critique my own system in a way that I develop a healthy, flourishing belief system for all people and ultimately act in a way that is for the flourishing of all people. Yeah. yeah. Not just think about it because all thinking is related to our acting. Yeah. And when we think these thoughts that, oh, I'm here to promote the flourishing of all people, see that love is at the center of everything, then I'm going to be again acting towards those things and aligning myself with it rather than aligning myself with, oh, if I believe that only certain people are in the in group, then I'm going to exclude others and I'm going to be okay with that, which now I definitely don't think that's okay. And I think yeah. that's problematic. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you can almost say that people who are unwilling to deconstruct and reconstruct their belief system um, could be really selfish in, um, in their, in their beliefs saying they're not even wrecking, like saying this works out for me, but not even taking into account how it affects the world in the majority at large. Yeah, I think you could say that, especially at an unconscious level, um, especially in light of our really individualistic Western philosophical ideas about personhood and who we are as persons being individual people who have private religious experiences that's the way I grew up and understood myself. But more and more as we recognize in the hard sciences, the social sciences, in theology, in the academy, in various spaces, we're learning that people are not just individuals, but rather we're very social, communal, and we are relationally attached to all these different people in the world. And on a larger level, we're attached to all of the universe um, in a quantum level. And so... Yeah this interrelatedness of human persons, you no longer begin thinking about yourself as my beliefs are my own beliefs, but rather my beliefs have effects on those I'm in relationship with. My beliefs are built in relationship with my community. And really theology at that point becomes a communal task. And that's when you really can realize, oh, I got this belief about hell from my pastor. Yeah. And that's the only place I got it from. I haven't actually done the study for myself to reckon with the problematic scriptures, the scriptures that point towards a more universal hope or passages that deal with like annihilationist view. So that's where faith becomes personal in the sense of you're going to take responsibility and ownership for your faith and the ramifications of it rather than being comfortable in your embedded theology. So I think the individualistic notion of privatized religious belief and faith, as that becomes deconstructed in itself and you recognize that you are a communal creature, you are a social creature, 
that moves theology into a broader public sphere where it's not just you inside your house, but rather it's you in relation to all of creation and everyone on the planet and how your faith and belief interacts with that larger scale. Yeah, completely. Um, and man, I, man, I <laughs> had so many thoughts while you were talking. It's just like it, the, uh, the tip and, you know, I guess, I guess you could call it the fundamental conservative Christians, uh, more very religious minded people. It's like, uh, I've noticed more and more as I'm deconstructing. And as I, you know, as my whole journey on my YouTube channel, see more and more, uh, like these, these, a people group that has this set of ideas, uh, and then they don't take into account, like it's, it's such this dogmatic mindset and law based mindset where it's like, I don't care if you're affected. This is what, you know, the law says this is, and it's just like, I think a, why, I think maybe why people don't reconstruct is, is fear of that. Like it, fear of questioning, fear of skepticism, fear of, you know, well, I'm, I'm more afraid of, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid of how it affects you. And, uh, if, if you're damaged in that, I'm afraid of what God thinks. And it could be based in that whole, uh, you know, uh, theological standing of, of, of hell and of, you know, even I, I've talked to a number of friends that they've admitted to me uh, that they're still, you know, Christians, uh, believing Christians going to church every Sunday. And they're like, yeah, I totally, I, I will admit I came into this faith out of fear. Like it wasn't out of a place of, of love. And so, you know, I think uh, maybe a reason just uh, these are thoughts that I'm having, you know, as you're as you're talking, it's just like a, a reason why, you know, those really dogmatic, fundamental people uh, in any religion really don't deconstruct is based out of fear of questioning of um, yeah, of questioning, of doubting, of being skeptical and looking at, you know, the specifically in Christianity, the Bible as something that should not be questioned. So what, what would you have to say to, to people like that? Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. I think within the Christian Protestant strand of religion, specifically where the scriptures take this authoritative, um, inerrant, infallible position, that then becomes the lens through which you read everything. So since the Bible can't be questioned, then everything has to be true in it. And there can't be these contradictions within it. And that is the ultimate like silencer. So you can be in any debate and you can ultimately say, well, the Bible says this end of discussion because that's the authority. Ultimately, you can't really like change someone's mind by just like arguing with them and trying to get them to yeah. see that your ideas are right. Yeah. So with that sense, like I think once you start questioning, is the Bible really what I've been taught it is been said to be like, is it this infallible thing? Is it completely without errors? And well, if it isn't, then what do I do from there? And I think once you deconstruct the idea that the Bible is the ultimate authority based on the inerrant, no errors, completely the word of God, then you can start recognizing, well, if that is problematic, then what else is problematic? So I think that can be one one strong impetus to then deconstruct other ideas that you've got just from the scriptures themselves. Mm. But I think there's a point that um, my professor at Bright, Dr. Nam Soon Kong, she says that everything has this double gesture in it. So with the Bible, you can say on the one hand, the Bible is the word of God. It is authoritative. It is this life-giving thing. But on the other hand, we recognize that it's patriarchal, it's sexist, it's endorsing slavery, it has all these problems with violence, and we hold those in tension. And I think that's a helpful way of even describing the deconstruction process is once you start questioning things, there are good things in tradition. And so you want to conserve those things. But also, we also want to contest those things that are doing violence to people that are creating inequality and injustice in the world. And holding those in tension is really part of the task of being a person who's on journey in theology is learning what do I want to conserve? What do I want to contest? 
and how do I hold these in tension in healthy and helpful ways? Yeah. And I think that, especially with the scriptures, because they're so important, especially if you come from a fundamentalist evangelical Protestant background, like I did, yeah, they're so pivotal pivotal that they're in your brain. They're like in your very being. You can't really yeah. just jettison it without having this horrific overturning of your life. Yeah. But yeah. rather finding out, okay, I can I can recognize that there's problems here and that's okay. Like it's it's okay to question the Bible because that's what the early Christians did. And I think this is something I really appreciate about Judaism and the Jewish religion and Jewish theology is that the Jewish tradition like thrives on debate. Like rabbis, they put in books, the rabbis debates with one another about scripture and how they're reading it and saying, well, this rabbi was wrong because I see it this way. And that's just like the end of that conversation. And then another rabbi picks up and says, well, that rabbi's wrong because I think this rabbi was right. And debate is just this welcome and healthy thing within the Jewish religion. Whereas I think once Protestantism took the Bible as the infallible authority, debate went out the side and said, okay, the debate's over because I said the Bible says it so. Yeah. Well, I think debate needs to be, in debate, not in this negative way, but really conversation, dialogue, wrestling with the text and wrestling with each other's ideas about theology, about God, about our doctrines, our beliefs and things like that. I think looking to the Jewish religion is helpful because that's what the early Christians who were Jews for a large part, that's what they're doing. They're wrestling with their sacred scriptures and trying to reckon with, well, I've had this experience with Jesus, this risen Christ. What do I do now with my sacred text? How do I live this Jewish way of life in light of this Christ event? I think that looking there and recognizing like Jesus was questioning his scriptures. Jesus was trying to figure out what he was doing with his sacred text in his community and that he himself is questioning the text. So it's okay for me to question the text. Like you said Jesus totally, was? Yes, Jesus was definitely questioning and challenging the text. And one of my favorite examples of him doing this is he comes to give his like first sermon and he reads out of the Isaiah scroll and he reads this passage and it gets to this final part where the triumphal like everyone's like gathering up because they're waiting for this moment where he's going to say in the great and terrible day of the Lord, like we'll come upon them and avenge, like we'll avenge the people. And in that passage, Jesus just ends and doesn't hit the like high climactic point, leaves it off, rolls up the scroll and says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And there's an uproar. And at the end of the story, they're wanting to throw him off the side of a cliff and kill him because he didn't finish the story how it's supposed to be read, how it's supposed to be interpreted. And he's doing his own thing with the scripture and saying that, no, God is not this vengeful, violent God. God is the one who's seeking justice on behalf of all people. God is the one that's healing people. God is the like life giving force. And I'm just going to cut this verse off. I'll end this sermon and move on. And that's who God is. Wow. And there's a lot of, I mean, tons of examples throughout. Yeah, scripture, I did. So. I had no idea. That's, that's amazing. And Paul, I mean, Paul is a very inventive interpreter of scripture. He'll take passages and add words that weren't there. He'll use a different, rather than using the Hebrew text, he'll use the Greek translation, which then fits in with his system of thought. So these early interpreters of scripture are doing extremely creative and novel things with the text because that was second temple Judaism, the time where Jesus and the early disciples and the Jewish religion of that day, that system is very inventive in it's like interpretive methods, hmm. um, especially at like the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran community outside of Jerusalem. And just looking at the systems of thought that are at play during those time periods, and then the later development uh, post-70 CE after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Judaism developed as the rabbis had to think through how do we do our tradition without the temple? And so that became the centerpiece was the text, and it was wrestling with the text, dialoguing with the text, putting in together these systems of thought of how we do rabbinical Judaism. So all of these 
early periods during that time when the text was so centered, it was still filled with this novelty and creativity and looking at the text, wrestling with it, and then trying to see how can I create this system of thought that coheres with what I know about God as the life-giving creator and what I'm seeing that is contrary in the text. Wow. So even, so you're saying the writers of the New Testament, which, you know, Paul, uh, John, Matthew, you know, the Gospels, ones that wrote the Gospels, letters of Paul, they, because of uh, Jewish thinking, Jewish thought, and the culture, you know, the, I guess the theological, how they operated, was cr- more creative and inventive instead of like a strict dogmatic law-based kind of thing. Absolutely. And even, I think, first the, I have to say this, I think the, in Christian circles, we use terminology like the Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah. And what that connotates is that the New Testament is new. The old is something that's old and we don't really have to pay attention to. And there's this superseding, which you get supersessionist out of, is this superseding of Judaic religion, the superseding of the Hebrew scriptures by the New Testament, where we don't need to pay attention to them. So in the, what I call the apostolic scriptures, that New Testament, the writers of that text like group called the Hebrew Bible or the Hebrew scriptures, they called them the scriptures. So in the New Testament, what they call the scriptures is the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, but what Protestants call the Old Testament. Hmm. And that's because the writers of the apostolic scriptures, the Christian scriptures, their text is the Hebrew Bible. Like they don't have any other text laying around. Like they're not going and like, oh, I just have Paul's text right here. Yeah. Oh, I have Matthew's gospel. It wasn't all collaborated, put together, or even written. Yeah. So in that process, the text they're drawing on is that Hebrew scriptures and some other texts during the that are around at that time. And when they're going back to those texts, even in the Hebrew Bible itself, you have the text challenging themselves. And so a good example is if you read the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, it's two different perspectives on the temple system and the sacrificial system. So Ezekiel is very pro-temple, all about keeping the institution of the sacrifices and doing all the things that are good and in light of the temple system. Jeremiah is like, God didn't instruct anybody about these sacrifices. God doesn't want your sacrifices. God wants justice. God wants mercy. So even in the Hebrew Bible, you have this um, intertextual debate where texts are interpreting other texts or challenging other texts, and these traditions are developing, and then they're all crammed together in what's called like the sacred text. And that was what Jewish people are referring to as, these are sacred scriptures for us, and they don't cohere. They're not one unified voice, but rather they're, they're themselves a conversation and debate that we're getting to be a part of and in that debate and dialogue we're developing our own like belief and faith within this tradition and wrestling with it so i think that is something that really helped me realize that the scriptures are something other than just this univocal speaking with one voice but rather a polyvocal there's a symphony of voices that i get to like join my voice with and wrestle with mm. and try to see what they're doing and wrestling with their images of God and what do I think about God? That's so beautiful. That. Yeah, no, yeah. that's, that's beautiful. I, you know, I haven't had those thoughts before. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And I guess I've through some different research I've done, uh, you know, and even just gone on one of my favorite websites ever, which is Quora and you can get on Quora, you can ask a question and then you can, you know, at, uh, you know, ask for people to answer the question based on their education or where they live or whatever. And so through Cora, I've asked, you know, these questions about the Hebrew uh, Bible and the, you know, Jewish culture and things like that. And they're like, you know, the, the Torah, the original Hebrew text is the only holy text. And I guess it's just like clicked with me now, which I'm like, Oh yeah. I mean, they're kind of, that that they're right in that. I mean, Paul was interpreting that, you know, like every, like the new Testament was just an interpretation of that. And then we hold these scriptures 
to or the you know these texts these letters as you know this dogmatic they are just as set in stone as something that was you know i don't know even know how many years beforehand um but it's like oh they're just doing the same things like you know people are like you you can't come up with your own interpretation or you can't do this and do that or whatever you can't you know make scripture like to say what you want it to say um which i mean i agree with that to some extent but in you know like what you were just saying that's what new testament writers did you know they they tried to figure out different ways to interpret and things to make sense of their beliefs and how it coheres with the world around them i mean it, it, I, that's what i got from what you just said essentially yeah i mean I think everyone like cherry picks their scriptures. Like there's no one that doesn't cherry pick the Bible and pull yeah. out the verses that go here with their system of thought. Um, yeah. Jesus cherry picked scriptures. Paul cherry picked scriptures. The Hebrew scripture writers cherry picked their own scriptures. So I think the idea that we all are grabbing from these sources, if you're in this Christian or Ju uh, Judaic systems of thought, you're pulling from these sacred texts and everyone is doing the same thing. But the question to ask is like, what cherries do we need to pick? What cherries are helpful and bring life to humanity? Which ones are harmful and dangerous and need to be reinterpreted or wrestled with and reckoned with? So, I mean, we all cherry pick, even people who believe the scriptures are just infallible, perfect, without errors. Those texts cherry are being pick. cherry picked. Yeah. So I know uh, if you could elaborate on it a bit more, because I know some people um, are going to react um, <laughs> to when you say even Jesus cherry picked scriptures. So could you talk a little bit more about that and what exactly you mean, or maybe some examples that you have, uh, like the other example that you gave? Gosh, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head. Um, well, I think just in the Gospels themselves, so there's an issue at hand with the Gospels in the sense of this is a much later recording of events that happened after Paul wrote his text. So Paul's letters come before the Gospels. And then these Gospels are coming along, these writers or schools of thought that are writing these texts, and they're thinking about the life of Jesus, this it's a retrospective account. So the gospels are taking their sacred text. They're taking this event that they've experienced of the risen Christ. And then they're reinterpreting his life in light of all of that and creating sort of like a biography, but it's a scripturally or so father John bear, he has this great phrase. He says the gospels are scripturally mediated memories in light of the passion. And what that means is they're taking texts, they're taking their memories, and they're doing it all in light of this reality they think is the truth of everything, like the risen Christ, this experience. If this is who God is in Christ, then we have to reinterpret all of these things in light of that. So this, the Gospels are themselves this uh, creative reinterpretation of Jesus's life, of the sacred text and weaving them together in this system of thought. Now, Jesus in those texts is oftentimes put up against, say, the Pharisees, um, which actually he probably would have been more aligned with Pharisaic, like traditional ideas of the text, of how to interpret the text. He very much aligns with the Pharisees in the way he does scriptural interpretation as presented in the Gospels. So this dichotomy between them is uh, uh, may historically be a pretty false dichotomy as strong as it is. Many people like the Pharisees become demonized, which is extremely unhelpful when we're talking about the Jewish religion and these Jewish people, the Pharisees, are not these demonized others. And I think that's important to state. So Jesus is often portrayed as being counter to the Pharisees, but what he's contrary to them in is how to interpret the sacred text. Hmm. And so there's this classic example of Jesus dialoguing about, well, your, your disciples are going through the fields and eating on the Sabbath. And Jesus pulls up scripture and says, well, don't you know what David did? He took the food from the temple and fed everyone in order to like survive. And he did that on the Sabbath and that was okay. But you're saying like, this isn't okay for my disciples to do. 
So Jesus often throughout the Gospels is depicted as interpreting Scripture in a way that is different than what the, say, the authorities of the day are saying. And, and that's why there was that. That's why there was conflict. that conflict between them. Got it. Yeah. And there's the, there's another story where if your oxen falls into a pit, will you go in and save it or not? And based on the the Torah, you're you can like save the oxen because it's an act of like hospitality and various people are interpreting it. And I may be wrong about that. Someone can check me on that. But Jesus responds like, of course you're going to go in and save it. Like you're not going to just let it die in the hole. Like, because the point of the Torah, the like central point of the Torah is like love and loving your neighbor, loving God, loving creation. And so to fulfill the Torah, it would be to pull out the oxen rather than say, go against the law and not pull the oxen out because you can't do work on the Sabbath. So there's all of these, what's like inter-religious debate. It's within the Jewish religion that Jesus, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of these scribal leaders, they're all debating within their own system of thought, within their own sacred text. And they're trying to understand the will of God, the law of God, what does it mean to follow God faithfully within our religious tradition? Got it. So I think a, a good segue into something that I want to uh, bring up and talk about that I think is related to all of this historical context and such of when looking at the scriptures, when looking at the Bible um, and in and, and the deconstruction process of the realization of what we've been talking about on how even the writers of the Bible interpreted scripture and, you know, how, you know, we have been doing the same thing and how it's okay to question. It's okay to, you know, investigate and doubt and all of that stuff. Um, what in the Bible, I think this is a huge, huge topic, huge question for people to even grasp, but what in the Bible is literal and what is myth and legend and it's just like you need to understand the culture because of the they they were storytellers essentially and so they had a bunch of myths and legends that it was easier you know because of lack of scientific understanding or whatever um, to use these stories um, in order to communicate a point um, and, you know, some people take it literally. Some people are like, no, it's not myth. It's not legend. It's not just a story. It's literal. And then there's times where it is literal. So what, what are your thoughts on that? And what have you, what research have you done on that? Yeah, that's a very big topic of discussion. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I realize that. <laughs> that's good, though. I think a good example is just looking at the creation accounts in the book of Genesis in the, Tor in the Torah. I think that when you look at that account, often some people interpret that as being literal. So there's a literal seven days of creation. And that then gets interpreted as saying this is like a thousand years for each day. And we're in like the 6,000 or 7,000 year, whatever. Um, so various interpretive strategies trying to like look at that literally and how would this have worked with science. And so even there you're getting this conflict of we understand how science is working but we have these sacred texts that we need to like make it work together and there's been creative ways of doing that there's other interpretations that are looking at that text and saying this is all about israel and israel's relationship to god and so adam in the garden is israel representing israel and in the adam's relationship to god He's supposed to do all of these things like take care of the animals, tend to the garden. And if you're doing these things in relationship with God, you'll be in paradise. But Israel's story is largely this, the kings or leaders of Israel or the people of Israel disobey God and they are sent to exile, say in Babylon or Assyria and things like that. And so they're kicked out of the garden and sent to the desert to wander or are sent into exile and they're apart from paradise because they disobeyed God. And so some uh, interpreters of the Genesis passage will look at that and say, this is actually like metaphorical or allegorical to God's relationship with Israel that we see throughout the Hebrew scriptures, where it's this return and going back to paradise or exile and being kicked out of paradise. Mm. There's other interpreters, uh, John H. Walton, he's a, a Hebrew Bible scholar. 
he talks about the seven days of creation being about the setting up of a temple. So in the Afro-Asiatic ancient Near East context, that passage in other temple texts where people are trying to describe how our religion is setting up a temple, they describe it in very similar ways as a creation story or creation myth. And so John H. Walton sees that this text is how the Hebrew people, the Israelite people understand God setting up God's temple, and they use the creation myth in order to set up the temple. So I think just within the plurality of interpretations, we can understand that to look at these texts and say they're literal, we have to say, in what sense are they literal? Like to take it literally as in this is a historical fact that happened in this exact way is an interpretation. It's one interpretation. Or you can say I'm taking this literally as an allegory or a metaphor. And that's literal in the sense of the way it's functioning as an allegory or metaphor for this specific people in time. But ultimately, I think when we look back and say, is this historical or not? The most we can do is look at like archaeological evidence. We can look at artifacts that we have, we can look at these texts, but then we're still interpreting all of that data, all of that data and trying to make assumptions about is this true or not based off what we have. So I think with the scriptures, I think largely it is just interpretation. We're all interpreting in different ways with the data we have and trying to make sense of it. I think there's helpful ways to do that. I think there's obviously harmful ways to do that as history has told us. Yeah. But we're always wrestling with that idea of how do I interpret this text? And then in the context that it existed in, how can I understand it better based on what other people were doing with their text, what the scriptures themselves say that text is doing and things like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think the first question that I think is uh, necessary in that of literal, non-literal, and there being so many different interpretations of a scripture of, you know, it could be literal, it could be non-literal based on, you know, the archaeological evidence and things like that. It's like, obviously, um, we want to know the truth of the matter. So it's like, obviously, it's like if it is, you know, if, if Genesis, the first two chapters are a poem, and then it, you know, I've heard, you know, first two chapters are a poem, and then it switches or something along those lines. It's like, you know, how do we discover the truth of that? Is it, is it really a, is the Bible meant for it to be a subjective thing? And like, well, it helps me more uh, if, you know, this is literal or it's like, you know, but again, what's, what's the truth in it? It's like, oh, this is a poem. And so, you know, the truth is always, I, I'm all, always under the impression that the truth is always what's going to create some sort of better result for myself and for you know, the world at large. And so uh, being able to tell what's truth is ultimately what what's behind the question of literal and non-literal, regardless of, you know, how it can be interpreted. So what would you say is like the gauge of despite interpretation, uh, how do we get to the truth of the matter? Yeah, I think that I think that in the modern period, truth became this capital T truth, and even in the pre-modern period, uh, truth as the capital T truth was largely tied up in theology, and then it moved into the hard sciences as being truth, as this is factual, real reality. And the authority on that is either pre-modern is theology, and then you're looking into the modern period is like the hard sciences, where if like science says this, like we can't combat it because it's just true, fact, period. Um, but as we moved into this, this postmodern period that where people categorize it as, where truth has been come has come under suspect, and we now recognize that capital T truth is constructed by people. So there's always people constructing truth. So then we look at from capital T truth to little t truths, and there are many truths in it based off context, your historical location, your social location. So I think for me, truth is ultimately like context specific. It's a uh, tentative and particular answer or response in a moment. Um, and it changes over time. So I think for me, looking at the question of truth, apart from interpretations is saying, 
what is for me in the context that I'm specifically situated in, in this time in history, in my own life and what I know of it, what is true to me? And then what is that truth doing in response to others? So if this is true to me, is this going to cause harm to others? Is this going to be a continuation of injustices and inequality in the world? And then I have to question, well, if that is true and it's causing harm in doing these things, then I don't really think that's true in the sense of it's going to be for the flourishing and betterment of humanity. And so I want to like look back and see, well, if that's not true, then I need to reinterpret this again. So for, for you, would truth be um, like, do you believe in objective truth or is it all subjective? I think this comes, I think it's a little of both in the sense of the objective side. I hold to a high view of like revelation. I think that God reveals God's self to humanity in Christ specifically within the Christian context of where I'm coming from. And that's just what Christian theology is doing. So that's my, that is my, what's in philosophy is called, you know, your first principle. Like it's something you can't prove. It just is what we're going to start with and then move and try to prove from that point onwards. And so the first principle that I'm working with is God reveals God's self in Christ and specifically on the cross and in the resurrection in that event. And that's where I'm working all of my theology out from and working out what is true based off what I perceive as being the revelation of God in the world. So that's where my interpretation is always in response to that event. So the crucified and risen Christ. So in respects to that event, um, have you, is that more, of just a, this is my first principle because this is what I feel is true? Or is it also based on research and understanding that you're like, actually, I think that this actually happened and that this is the truth of the matter? Yeah, I think, I mean, both. I think for me, this is the, an experience I've had that I, I feel is true. And then also based on my own studying, I feel it is true in the sense of the history of the Christian tradition in that I've been brought up in, the study that I've been a part of, the community I'm a part of. I think all of those come together and point to like, this is a reality and it's only, it can only be witnessed to, it can't be factually like, we can't go back with a video camera and say, when we're looking at the dead man on the cross, Jesus, there's God revealing God's self and all of these like things that we say about it. Yeah but it's only in this communal witness, this journey that I'm going on is that it's continually been shown true to me in my own life. Whether that's true for anyone else, that's not up for me to like decide based on one, what I know of like the hard sciences and neuroscience and how language is really stuck in our brain to the point that we, even when hearing other religions talked about to us, we're interpreting it through our already preconceived ideas of our say for me, Christian religion. So I'm hearing someone talk about say Buddhism and I'm thinking through, Oh, that sounds like salvation. So that must be salvation where in reality, that is not even a term in the Buddhist tradition. Yeah. And so I think that's where for me, I'm like, I have this Christian tradition that frames the world for me and I'm already inputting so much information through that lens. How can I work with it in this lens that is, helpful for humanity and true to the tradition that I'm in. Yeah. So off the top of your head, um, what have you, what are, what are some like historical or factual uh, data that you've seen uh, that for you, it's like, yeah, this, it's not just a feeling, but the cross and the existence of Jesus is backed up in that way. I think for me, it's in looking at, so I view the cross as a, like, in a sense, a twofold event. So on the one hand, it's revealing God's self in God's trueness. And that would be this nonviolent willing to suffer rather than enact harm on others. So you have that, like, why don't you call down angels and save yourself, Jesus, the people crying out from the crowd, like save yourself. But I see that as God saying, that's not what God is like. God is not like this, um, imposing violent destructive being but rather is self-giving love for all of humanity and willing to suffer to the point of death and beyond death 
in order to establish that's what God's like. On the other hand, I see it as revealing humanity as extremely violent. Um, so Jesus in the Gospels is portrayed as being innocent the whole way through, as having not done anything wrong, and even the authorities saying that this man is innocent, he's done nothing wrong, and Pilate wiping his hands clean of it. So I think Jesus is innocent through it all. His being on the cross is an innocent man, known as an innocent man, publicly executed for crimes he didn't do. And that reveals the violence of our human systems that in order to maintain peace and cohesiveness in the structure that we have, we will crucify innocent people in order to maintain our cohesion and our, uh, our like uh, social structures. And so I see that as a point where we as human beings throughout our history are extremely violent people, but we've slowly become less and less violent. Um, and I see that as a point where Christianity has had an influence on the world and specifically in places where the Christian scriptures and Christianity has an, had an impact is you do have movements away from violence to nonviolence. You have, um, obviously you have terrible things done in, in the name of Christianity. So there is that tension as well that this religion in its pure form, I would say, is this nonviolent co-suffering love in a religion that is established by looking at Jesus as the model. On the other hand, you have this religion that can be militarized, can be institutionalized and done and do a lot of harm and damage and to the point of crusades, inquisitions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the biggest points for me is that Christianity as a germ is infecting humanity in various ways that people are able to move past their violent tendencies or wanting to go to war and things like that. But I see pacifists, I see nonviolent resistance. I see these people modeling another way of being in the world and then pointing back to Jesus as the example. So that's one of the biggest points for me. Gotcha. So you're just, you basically are able to, uh, through historical studies that you've seen is that there is a point in history where uh, humanity started to become less violent. Um, and a big part of that was the Christian tradition of Jesus and dying on the cross. Is, am I hearing that right? That's basically what yeah. you see. And I think it even goes back to the Hebrew scriptures. I think if you look around the literature of the time, we know that that famous phrase, like history is written by the winners. And so the winners, when they're writing history, they're not going to talk about all these negative connotations or innocence of victims or anything like that. But once you get to the Hebrew scriptures, you have a prolific, like so much data that is saying that we are innocent. God, we are the suffering victims. God, come and save us from our enemies. You have in literature for the first time, the voices of victims. Whereas in all this other historical literature, we have the voices of the victors, the voice of the oppressors. And so through this strand of the Hebrew scriptures, you have this development where the, the function of empire itself, Israel becomes empire and enacts damage on other people and harm and does all these violent crusades and things like that. But then you have the flip side of that in the Hebrew scriptures where it's prophets calling out the violence of the nations, that you're creating victims of the widows and the poor and the children. So you have that inner critique in the Hebrew Bible itself of the victim is coming true because God is on the side of the victim and God is revealing the victim's voice. And it's a critique to all of the ways you're doing your way of living that is violent, destructive, conquering, etc. So I see it even, even in the Hebrew scriptures, especially in the suffering servant song in Isaiah, that that is a huge picture and revelation of what God is like and also the voice of the victim is the most important thing. Like God is on the side of the victim. God is not on the side of the perpetrators or the violent. And that is like the revelation for me. Hmm. Well, that's uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I've, I've heard things along that uh, strand before of like, if you look at history, then you see that the Christian uh, tradition uh, that, that things, uh, things changed. You know, I've, I've heard that before of, of being a, um, that there's legitimacy in Christianity. I haven't done personally that research myself. Um, but I, 
yeah. So I guess that takes more research on my end, but um, cure, I th- question. So um, as we're talking a lot about, you know, Jesus and history and, you know, the myth, the legend, literal, deconstructing, all of that, um, it, it can sound uh, very much like so i i I guess i should have i should have asked this at the beginning but for you and your beliefs now you know from someone who's listening right now um they can say well this dude is definitely 100 percent christian i see no difference in what i believe than he does he's all you know like (laughs) he's he's there there's no difference uh in from like even a conservative standpoint what would you say how how do your beliefs and how you see uh, Jesus um, and the Gospels and Christianity or you know things of that nature? How would you say your personal beliefs differ from someone of a traditional or more dogmatic uh, background? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think if an outsider is looking in at my life, they'd be they'd find it difficult to do a lot of distinguishing, especially in the sense of I am in a worshiping community. I am very intrigued and appreciative of the Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition. So a lot of my language is very traditional with regards to my uh, explaining of theology and trying to explain it. But I think where I differ is in my emphasis on the victim's voice and that God is on the side of the victims. And what that means is that if God is on the side of the victims and if Jesus is revealing what God is like, and we are called to follow the path of Jesus by taking up our cross, then that is counter to any system or religious setup that continues to oppress, continues to exclude, continues to dominate, continues to uh, colonize, other peoples based off a religious conviction that God is on their side or God is this exclusive being that says you are my chosen people and these other people are not, but rather it's a universalizing of God in Christ that says all of humanity is sacred and created in the image of God. And because of that, God always is siding on the side of those who are being victimized and harmed and done violence to, and God is in that suffering with them. And the role of the Christian is to stand in solidarity, to go alongside victims and be on the side of victims. So that has a lot of political implications. That has a lot of economic implications, has a lot of implications all the way down. And part of that is my own struggle of finding out what does that mean for my own personal life with a lot of privilege, a lot of um, beliefs in my past that are damaging and have caused harm. How do I reckon with that? And how do I continue to move towards a life that looks like Christ where I'm not going to stand for militarization. I'm not going to stand for the continued colonizing of other people's um, beliefs, thoughts, land, culture, etc. So a lot of it does look contrary in the sense of a conservative traditional Christianity because of the social implications, political implications, economic implications, et cetera. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I should have said that at the beginning um, or asked you that at the beginning, just so people would know a bit more where you're at. Um, But it's a good segue to into talking more about um, specific deconstructing, even though I think a lot of what's already been said a lot. I mean, I know that I've seen the light <laughs> even more so in a couple areas. And I'm like, man, this is just good stuff, uh, especially about, you know, the interpretation of scripture and whatnot. But, you know, inside of all of this deconstructing, inside of interpreting uh, and how we interpret scriptures, uh, how we, um, you know, just being able to question what we believe because it's, we're not just focusing on ourselves, but we're focusing on the world at large. You know, basically the, the entire deconstructing uh, process, right? Now, I want to talk about uh, the, the battle here because there is a battle here. Um, it's not just, obviously, every, not everyone is philosophically or theologically inclined, nor do they even 
want to be. Some people, you know, they grew up with that embedded theology um, or philosophical view on life or spiritual view on life. And they're like, this is it. This is concrete. Um, and a lot of that is, uh, has to do with the, you know, uh, well, a lot of that more dogmatic thinking, you know, involves, uh, you know, that esoteric, um, like, like secret collective group or, you know, the theology of hell gets in all of that. Um, and so it can be hard to deconstruct out of that. It can be very difficult to deconstruct out of those fear-based mindsets, out of those, um, you know, the, the, just the ways of thinking because of family and friends around you. Um, and so there is this massive battle with deconstructing that I know that I have I constantly deal with. I know that you, you're constantly dealing with it um, based off of, you know, personal conversations that we've had. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to talk about that battle for a little bit, um, because it's like everything that we're mentioning is like, it's all good stuff. It's all great stuff, but it's like, how, you know, how do we tell a, uh, our, our, our family members, which might be super conservative and, and fundamental in their thinking that it's like, I don't think hell exists. You know, it's like, I think Jesus did save everybody. Or, you know, I think that we can question and reinterpretate scripture um, in a number of ways. And we're allowed to do that. And, you know, even the writers did that. You know, this would all be like heresy. And, you know, like, no, absolutely not. Like, in order for God to be a God of love, there has to be hell. You know, that whole frame of thinking. And it's like, uh, even, and I guess going even further into not just specifically changing views on Christianity. But I know for me, you know, cause I don't consider myself a Christian. Um, you know, I don't, you know, so, some days I waste, wake up and I'm like, Oh, I'm totally agnostic. And other days I wake up and I'm like, I'm an atheist. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know where I fall in these, in these places. Uh, you know, I'm on that journey of the reconstruction and of, you know, uh, spirituality and, and exploring that and what that looks like. And so there's this constant battle uh, with my surroundings. And so that obviously affects me in, inside myself. And so I know for me and how I've dealt with it is it's just like obviously having communication with you and building up, you know, that uh, community of people on my YouTube channel, um, you know, different, not just you who I went to ministry school with, but other people that have, I went to ministry school with, and they're also deconstructing. They're like, I don't know if I can call myself Christian. I don't know if God's real. I don't know what I believe. It's like, how, how do we cope with that battle? Like, and, and you can even, you know, you're, you're free to share your, your struggle and your battle, um, with how you're managing it and how, you know, other people can gain hope in their deconstruction process, that, that battle in it. Yeah. Um, I think for me with what you were just saying about, like, I'm not a Christian, I'm on the journey. I can say Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard has this great phrase where he says like, I am still becoming a Christian or I'm hoping to become a Christian. Like, I think that's where I met. Like if the goal of a Christian is to be this quote, like little Christ or Christ like, then I'm not a Christian. Like I don't look anything like that. I like yeah. middle-class white American male cisgender, all of the like privileges power that I have. Like I don't look like that dead Nazarene on the cross who's suffering on behalf of those who like put him there. I think that that is a thing that, I'm striving towards like I see the beauty and the wonder in it and the awe in looking at a person whose life is like given for others so like the mother Teresa's the um, MLK Jr. these figures throughout history that have propped up and been these beautiful examples of what it looks like to follow Jesus with their own problems obviously they're not perfect but just seeing that it costs so much and I'm like striving towards that I'm saying I want to like follow in the ways that they followed in these radical ways um, without losing my humanity. So I think that's one thing that has given me kind of given me some peace and some space to relax into it and say, I'm not going to arrive. I'm on this journey to become a Christian. It has been a helpful reframing and something I've really pulled on. 
I think also for conversations with people, I've done it bad a lot of times uh, and have learned or hopefully have learned from those experiences where in sharing with people, I can want people to get to where I am. So I'm basically saying like, I want you to be like me. I want you to believe what I believe because I believe what I believe is right. And what I believe you believe is harmful, dangerous, and wrong. Well, I think that can be very problematic because then it's just me enforcing my beliefs on another person, trying to dismantle their thoughts um, rather than being, I guess, like sneaky or wise about it and saying, having conversations with people and posing questions in a way that gets the other person to think or even asking them like, what is something that you struggle with in your tradition? Or what is something that's always been hard for you with the scriptures or your upbringing or faith in your lived experience and how have you wrestled through that and kind of seeing if they already have things that they're like struggling with. Like I've always had a problem with hell, but it's something I just have to believe and getting that conversation started that way because then you're offering, you're offering things that are helping them on their own journey or questions that can help guide them on their own journey rather than posing your journey on the other person. Yeah. So I think that's something I, I've had to learn the hard way by screwing up a bunch yeah. is people are on their journey. They're all at their own place. I've been on my own journey. I've been in all the like extremes of evangelical fundamentalism, charismania, et cetera. And I like thrived in those spaces, thought it was great, thought I was right. And now looking back, I'm seeing the good and the bad and trying to like hold those intention in a part of my story. So in talking to others, I can have more grace because I remember, oh, I remember when I believed those things. And I remember how hard and difficult and painful it is to start questioning and going through that process. But ultimately, I think having conversations is helpful. I think there also needs to be a caution, like don't go into every conversation trying to confront the big challenging pieces and getting into heated arguments and just ending up in like fights or debates that are unhelpful for you in particular and also the other person. Yeah. So keeping guard to like, what am I willing to talk about? How far am I willing to go? Because at some point you're just throwing out information and it's not like both people are just beating their heads against a wall, trying to convince the other person that they're right. And I think that can be difficult and hard and not really fruitful for either party. Yeah. Yeah, so no, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, definitely. And, you know, that rem, that reminds me of a thought I had yesterday of I have to be careful because a lot of, obviously, a lot of things that I talk about and a lot of things that I say on my YouTube channel, you know, there's a lot of people that don't agree with me. A lot of people don't, don't understand where I'm coming from. A lot of people that don't understand my process and my journey. And so they can be very... Uh, for lack of a better term, hateful um, and, you know, spreading that. And then I have to be very careful of myself too, because if I just come back at them with that same hate, then I'm just becoming a part of that cycle and, you know, really becoming a part of the problem again. It's like, so I, I realize that, you know, I, I got to be super careful that it's like, oh, I do feel strongly about this now. But like, if I combat hate with hate, And just, you know, then I'm just going to keep that fight going. I'm not actually solving any issues or any problems. And that can be very difficult for somebody who, you know, has done the research and that has become so passionate about the things that they found and the truth that they found. Um, And so, you know, there's that battle too of not not becoming a part of that system um, that, you know, it's it's like you're it's it's almost like you never left the system then you're still in that that war and that battle that doesn't even mean need to be taking place, you know? Totally. Yeah. And I think there's like an epistemological humility that we need in the sense of we don't know everything. We can't know everything. And so the collective knowledge that we have in the sense of other people and their experiences and their journeys, I think there's a large thing that we can learn from listening to others, even if we disagree. Um, And even when it's really hard, I think there's a point where listening can become complicit, whereas people are espousing uh, white supremacist ideology or uh, harmful, hateful, sexist, patriarchal 
et cetera, et cetera, ideologies. And those need to be confronted or not engaged with in the sense of like you recognizing that person is a hateful, harmful person and not intentionally going in there to like debate and dialogue with them in that sense for your own protection or not wanting to be re-traumatized, et cetera, depending on people's social locations and what they've been through. I think that, yeah, having humility and being willing to listen, I think that's something I've learned the last three years is that it's a process and it's hard because I'm like super prideful and want to just be like right about everything and yeah. want people to like, just listen to me. Yeah. But really learning that the past three years of just listening to people who have hugely different perspective worldviews and life experiences than me and really trying to listen to learn and like not listen to combat or listen to prefigure my like response. And it's been hard because I'm not perfect at that at all. I'm actually horrible at it because I just hear people talk and I'm like, oh, well, I think this, I've already read this, da, da, da. and it really becomes this egoistic like puff up rather than I don't know. In the end, my, my whole entire system of thought is an interpretation yeah. and it can be totally wrong, but being willing to really engage the other person before me, humanize them and not just depersonalize them into a system of thought that I'm trying to argue with and really engage with the other that's before me in a loving relational dialogue that I can grow from, I can learn from. And in that interchange, hopefully grow and be changed for the better. Awesome. So that's, I mean, good stuff. <laughs> it's great stuff. I, uh, I'm curious and I shifting into another different direction that also has to do with uh, deconstructing is uh, the talk of the supernatural. Um, so I know based on, um, well, not based on anything. I know that I have had experiences. Um, I haven't talked a lot about them on my channel um, that it's like, could that have been something? Could that, you know, could I be experiencing a supernatural? I don't, I don't know. You know, for, for me, it's, it, it's up to interpretation. And even as I did, I've done more study into uh, out of body experiences and done more study onto, you know, lucid dreaming um, that, you know, I can, I can look back at some of those experiences and be like, Oh, okay. That's what it was kind of thing. Um, and so, in, in, and I, the talk of the supernatural and experience of supernatural is very important to me because I feel like uh, to truly come into a belief of something, and I get, I think this is, I know that this is really a subjective interpretation. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, on and if you agree or not. But I think to truly come into a belief of something, even that's closer to like knowing is to really experience something where it's like you have no, there's no shadow of a doubt that it's like, this is absolutely real. There is something greater. There is something more. It's, it's no longer just this uh, agnostic type feeling, but it's become this theistic like you know, certainty, if you will. Um, I think that encountering the supernatural and going after the supernatural um, has a lot to, in, has a lot to do with making these things, certainties instead of just uh, questions. And so I know that, like I said, I've had different encounters or experiences. Um, some of them I can now, I, I have language uh, from research I've done that I can say, this is exactly what it was. And some of them to this day, I'm like, I'm not sure what that was. Um, and I know that based off conversations I've had with you in the past that you used to experience, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. And even when I knew you at ministry school, it was just like all this stuff was happening uh, to you that you had, you had seen or heard or crazy things. And now you look at them differently. Um, and so, to, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, that belief and if you agree with that and also your experience with the supernatural and now how you interpret it. Totally. Uh, yeah, I'd say I'd agree in the sense that, I mean, ultimately all we have is the experiences that we have and then the frameworks that we have to interpret those experiences. And I think there are experiences that in neuroscience has explained a lot of this in the sense of when you meditate or 
or in a worship experience after a certain amount of time or uh, sessions, the brain is able to shut off various pieces of itself in order to expand into this timeless state and this state of being that is connected more to others. So the blurring of your brain's ability to distinguish between yourself and others uh, begins to shut down and you actually experience this like oneness or unity. So I think even just in our brains where we have this capacity to deeply connect and have these experiences that aren't able to be put into language in a sense or interpreted in such a way that you're going to explain the nuances or this is exactly what that was. And I know I have experiences that still, I don't know what they were. I'm like, I don't know what that was. I didn't have a framework where I'm like, I'm going to go off into this like mystical trance or whatever and experience all this weird stuff happen. And then I'm going to know exactly what happened because I had no framework for those things, especially yeah. early on when I wasn't really interested in religion, Christianity or anything. And the, the starting initially, uh, initiation of my process into going into theology was based off a radical experience that today is the point that I go back to. I'm like, that was something other encountering me that was full of love. And I don't know how to explain it, but if that's what God is like, then I want to explore it and search it out. And so really my whole process started from an experience that I have no way to really describe. I have different ways of interpreting it now or looking at things, but I think there is validity in the sense that we experience things that either at the unconscious level or the conscious level that we can't really explain and have language for it is this interpretive process and it's supernatural and we don't know what happened in totality, but it is this un, unexpressible experience. That's like, I don't know what that is, but it's powerful. It's transformative. I think with regards to supernatural experiences, I think it has largely in various ways been used in harmful ways. So I think when it's supernatural experiences become an individualistic thing to where this person in specifically, I'm thinking of the charismatic movement, supernatural experiences become this like badge of honor that is used as yeah. that person must be really holy and be yeah. more in touch with God than I am. I wish I could be like them. I wish I could have these experiences. And it becomes a differentiating point that puts certain Christians on a pedestal and then says they're more holy, more close to God than other people. Yeah. Whereas I think if you have a true spiritual experience, it should be one, it should be transformative in good ways, but also I think it should be something that any other human on the planet could be able to experience it. It's just a part of being human is that we experience things and we are connected to like all of life and all of creation and things beyond us rather than since I have this experience, I'm going to use it as something that I have over another person to show that I have the answers or I have the like spiritual know-how to get to God. So I think it creates like gatekeepers in a way from keeping people away from the presence of presence of God and things like that. Yeah. So I think, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm just, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's, it's so true how you can build up this uh, spiritual pride um, that it's, it's like, Oh yeah, I've experienced this and you have it. It's like, it's this, it's this thing in the charismatic movement, especially uh, that where it's like, it's an unspoken, you know, it's like everybody's trying to get there. Everybody's trying to go for this. And then once you experience it, then you're, you know, you're kind of puffed up a little bit and you're like, I got this under my belt. And it's like, man, and it's, it's such this tension because it's like, obviously you want to have those type of encounters if they're real, if we have access to those things and it creates, you know, if it is a part of being human and we have yet to realize that, then it's like, yeah, we do want to have these encounters. But the problem is, you know, that pride that comes into play to where it becomes something that it's like, you've achieved this. And, you know, then everyone else around you has not, is not at that spiritual level that you're at. So completely agree with what you're saying. And I think, uh, especially in those settings, while the like, impetus towards supernatural encounters can be good. I think oftentimes it becomes a detriment to larger issues with regards to we're this insular church that can provide experiences or whatever for people. 
but that's where it ends. It becomes this privatized religion and this religious experience that then has no connection to other people outside. So people have experiences and then it's like, well, I have that experience. Great. But all it did for me was puff me up with pride and then make me want to continue to have experiences so I can continue being like over top of other people and grow within this certain context rather than what I consider true spiritual experiences as being connective and going outside of yourself in the sense of feeling belonging to one another, feeling a responsibility for other people in the world that we live in as human beings and connecting us rather than it becoming this insular creation of privatized people that are all about getting their own experiences in order to be more holy, more spiritual or whatever. And I think that is a, a huge th pattern that I see in the context that I've been in, in the charismatic movement is that it's all about the pursuit, but it's always this privatized pursuit and it's extremely Gnostic, uh, Gnostic being the, uh, large broad category for an ancient heresy, a group of people's beliefs um, that was a separation that the material world was bad and evil, the body is bad and evil. And this group claimed to have secret knowledge coming from the Greek gnosis, meaning knowledge, that they had secret knowledge of paths and spirituality to get to God. And that in order to get there, you had to get this secret knowledge from these people in order to have that knowledge to go into these spiritual encounters or whatever, mm. and eventually leave your body and go off to this supernatural paradise or whatever the conception was of the afterlife. Mm. And so I think there's a lot of parallels today, and especially just Christianity at large. There's this body spirit dualism that occurs that says, our bodies aren't the like most important thing and have nothing to do with spirituality. It's all about this esoteric off in the space nebulous spirituality. That's all about going off into these trances or having these encounters and ultimately wanting to go to that place rather than it being an embodied practice or an embodied spirituality that is in relation to other people is looking at the body and materiality as good and not this thing to be jettisoned and also not holding secret knowledge because that's not what Christianity has been about. It's always been about, this is for all people. It's good news for all people. It's not about holding secret knowledge to have over top of people. So there's a lot of parallels, um, a lot of good literature on the parallels between Gnosticism and Pro Protestant Christianity today. And I think that's largely a giant problem in those movements and something I've personally experienced and been a part of in perpetrating I have spiritual encounters. You should be like me. I don't know how you can have them, but I've just been lucky enough to have them and I'm super prideful about it. So very damaging, very hard, but there is that tension of like, these are real things. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, it is one of those things where it's like, yeah, I mean, can we explain it? You know, there's definitely spiritual teachers um, out there and uh, you know, a number of YouTube videos that I watch with these, uh, teachers and with uh, people who, uh, you know, they, they like lucid dreamers or, um, you know, people who have out of body experiences, you know, all the time, you know, I've talked to these people and, um, you know, even some Christians and even mentors of mine in the past that it's like, you know, I can have these supernatural encounters and I'm like, great. Um, <laughs> and it's, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where I'm like, fantastic i want that um but it, it is this tension it's it's this pull of like how how do you create this um or not create how do you like like teach this understanding of you know if you are one of those people that encounter the supernatural on a daily basis that it is like it's not this gnostic type thinking or it's not this um you know, I can do it and you can't because I'm someone special, you know, um, you know, how do you, how do you do that? And I don't think, you know, if, if the supernatural is something that is real, if the supernatural is something that everybody can encounter, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's not, I don't think people even have a grasp on it yet. I don't, I don't even know if we've evolved to a point of being able to have a completely solid grasp on it. Um, to where we can tell, 
oh, this is something supernatural. This is something not supernatural. And, you know, that whole thing, because then, then that can even get into, you know, psychedelics and, you know, DMT effect on the brain and how DMT is released. And it's this natural thing, but it can create, you know, hallucinations. And it's like, what's real, what's not, what's supernatural, what's not, what's just our body experiencing something uh, greater or something, whatever. So I, I saw you nod your head like you had a thought there. So I want to, did you have a thought that you were? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, I think it goes back to the idea that we had this Cartesian dualism of the body and the mind or the body and the brain. Um, and that separation has been largely overturned in the scientific community but is still getting to the popular and even in the academic level uh, that we, we, we don't think apart from our bodies and we don't experience things apart from our brains and minds. They're totally connected. And largely our brain is a observer of our body's interactions with the environment around us and with itself. And it's this monitoring system that is sending signals, receiving signals, and so I think that, like you're saying, like to say something in a sense, supernatural doesn't make sense because everything is natural. Everything is experienced through our bodies, through our minds, through these interpretive lenses that we have. And it's our experience of ourselves and things that are outside of ourselves. So I think there's, I mean, tons of work to be done. I'm like fascinated by the questions of if we're largely this body that is experiencing all these things, including our brains, what does that mean for these quote supernatural things? What are these? Are these um, just our brains configuring something because we are in this meditative state or in this state of arousal or whatever it is? How do we then interpret that in a way that doesn't disconnect us from the larger humanity and also disconnect us from our own bodies, but does it in an integrative and holistic way? So I think the, the movement away from the idea that our minds are this other thing than our bodies, but rather connecting it is an important move because then it grounds all our spiritual practices in our body and our lived experience and not apart from them. So even in worship, like everything we do in a worship service is embodied, like whether you're sitting there or whether you're standing or raising your hands in worship or even sitting, listening to something, all of our bodies are interacting with one another. We're syncing up or getting into this emotional attunement. Um, and all of that is embodied and mental. It's two sides. You can't like separate them. So that's something I think just for your listeners, like seeing that our bodies are not something that is apart from us in our minds, but is intimately connected is an important thing to consider when we do spiritual practices or engage in them not to ignore our bodies, but to include them and recognize they're the sole means that we interact with the world and ourselves. Yeah. And we need to value them and have compassion on them and love our bodies because it's who we are. Yeah. And I've heard this in the past. I'm not sure how legitimate it is, but that uh, like Hebrew and I'm, I'm, always, I, I'm fascinated with Hebrews in their, the, the Jewish language, Hebrew culture, all of that. I'm fascinated by it because of this. Um, it, it's interesting how language and the culture, language and culture affect the way that we think. Um, and so um, something that I heard years ago is that Hebrews um, don't have, or Jewish, you know, Jewish culture, they don't have a word for supernatural. It's all just natural. Um, which I find really uh, interesting because, I mean, it's, it's correct in a sense that if the supernatural exists and we can all take part in that, then it is just a part of nature. It is just a part of how we've been naturally made and evolved. Um, and, you know, maybe that's even a part of Gnostic thinking, of the, you know, that there's a difference between natural and supernatural. Um, I think the question for me still stands, you know, e even if I were to experience something that is greater and outside of myself and I were to be completely aware, like how would I distinctify like this is definitely God or this is, you know, how would that happen? But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think 
I mean, there's totally that distinction in even saying like I'm experiencing something supernatural, but it the experience is happening in your cognitive embodied like interpretation and experience of it. So all experiences is within your head and your body. Yeah. So it, whatever it is, this like projection fantasy, something imposing itself. I don't know. That's a lot of mystery for me with regards to like, what is science? Like maybe it'll explain it. Maybe it never will. Yeah. Um, and I'm okay with that mystery because that gets way too deep for me. And I yeah. think, the limits of my thinking is that once we're getting into those nitty gritty details, I'm out. Like I'll just experience <laughs> something and recognize it's in my body. Uh, but yeah, I think in distinguishing, there's a whole lot of neurotheology that's looking at like, is there spots in our brain that are like God spots? And a lot of that has been overturned just by the idea that our brain doesn't have specific spots for specific activities, but rather is an integrated whole. And it is, relating to itself and communicating within itself and pulling from various areas. And I think that saying like, is this experience a God experience? I don't know how you would determine it. I think it largely is going to go back to whatever presuppositions or pre neural connections that you have regarding to how you would interpret any type of experience. So me coming from a Christian theistic perspective, I'm going to attribute something or interpret some experience as a divine experience or configure it in a certain way based off what I understand and the frameworks that I have rather someone from a different tradition or just atheist or agnostic may interpret it just as like the universe, divine love, whatever, or just an experience of something, but I don't really have language for it. I'm not going to label it. There's various ways to do it, but I think it largely goes back to the way we experience anything is always interpreted and whatever interpretive frame you're using is going to configure it in a certain way. Yeah. For good or for lack. Yeah. Yeah. So something that is like has been brought up um, several times throughout talking about the supernatural. And I guess, I mean, this still falls under, you know, deconstructing it and deconstructing what is the supernatural? What does it look like? How can we just, you know, like distinctify it or, you know, how, what is all of that? I, I still think this is all along the lines of deconstructing, but I feel like what this leads to, which I heard it best by, uh, I don't know. I don't know if this is the best way to put it, but Richard Rohr, I was listening to his podcast and he said something along the lines of people naturally drift from a dualistic thinking into non-dualism. Um, and, you know, talking about just like you were saying from the Gnostic point of view that, you know, everything that's material is bad and the supernatural is good. And it's this very dualistic thinking, even going back to when we were talking about uh, briefly talking about because we, we 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 debated whether or not we should talk about it in this podcast, but we'll probably do it in another podcast. Heaven and hell and theology of hell and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but even that being dualistic thinking, uh, that there are these two opposing sides that are always battling it out with each other. So I think uh, in, as Richard Rohr puts it, people naturally have this progression from a non-dualistic point of view into, I mean, a dualistic point of view into a non-dualistic point of view. And um, like, I, I think it's in the deconstruction process coming into that non-dualistic point of view, like, what does that even, what does that even mean? Cause I've, that's a term that I've heard several times, but I didn't really understand it until just a couple of weeks ago of like, Oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. And, you know, I feel like a lot of the deconstructing that I've done has led me to, you know, this, um, this non-dualism and that it's, it's super beneficial and helpful. So um, just curious and want to hear your thoughts and what you've learned about non-dualistic thinking, um, what that is and, and why it's a benefit and why, you know, uh, why in this deconstruction process, it's led there. So take it away. <laughs> um, so dualism, in a sense, you can just think about it as either oppositional pairs or just pairs of things. So on the one hand, you could have like light and dark, good and evil, heaven, hell. Um, these two uh, 
apparent or perceived, depending on the position, uh, opposing entities or ideas. And dualism largely states that like the ultimate good or the ultimate light is where we're all trying to get to. And the, anti uh, the antithesis to that is your, the darkness, the hell, heaven, hell, etc. Non-dualism says that ultimately those opposing sides create in and out groups. It creates uh, problems in your thinking when you regard one side over against another side, because then life experiences are not just either or like I'm not just experiencing good and that isn't bad. There's complexity, there's multiplicity, there's a whole lot of complexity within our experience. So when we're looking at life and we see this complexity and then we try to use dualistic frames to categorize things or make sense of things, we come into problems. So if only the people in my church, because we have the right doctrine, are going to heaven and everyone else is going to hell, that creates a huge problem because only a small group of people are getting to heaven. Everyone else is going to hell. What's that say about God? What's that say about like our ethical stances? What are the ramifications for that? So non-dualism, a good way to think about it within human development is early on, it isn't until your mid twenties that your brain finally like in a sense finishes its developmental process in order to hold tension in a healthy, like way that you can comprehend in a good sensible way rather than early on. It's much harder for children and largely don't have the capacity to do it is to think in this like either or holding two things at once, but rather it's very like black and white, good, evil, so even in like Christian education, they talk about like child development in order to teach them. We want to teach them like God is love. God is not evil or hateful and doing it in a dualistic way because that's helpful for their developmental process and their uh, neural development. But later in life, we recognize the complexity of life and we recognize that our systems don't hold all of this together. So non-dualism really is that on the one hand, there is evil in the world. On the other hand, there's good in the world and we have to hold these in this tension and that life really is in that liminal in-between space and that we exist even within ourselves. We have good and evil, love, hate, all of these like opposing opposites, but they exist in one body. And that's really the benefits of non-dualism is it accounts for a lot of the complexity in the world. I think there still is good to dualism. I think it can function in specific context in particular settings for a benefit in the sense of we need to make a decision now in order to either save this this uh, going extinct population of animals and we need to decide really shortly before they go extinct and that's a point where you need to like weigh off things in a pretty black and white manner and say to do this action we need to say this is good this is bad we're going with the good and we're going to do that now rather than just sitting in complexity and say, let's complexify this till all of these animals go extinct. Yeah. So it has its function and its health, um, but it has its problems as well, just like any other system. But du non-dualism and spirituality is extremely helpful because we recognize that life and its complexities is very similar to the way that we deal with our faith. Like faith is not just this simple system that's given to us and it works in every situation, but rather we hold a lot of things intention like if God is love then what do I do about evil and that's seemingly in contradiction but a lot of people have tried to create this liminal space where they're dealing with if God is love then God doesn't do evil so I'm gonna explain it way in a humanistic way or if God is love and God is evil then how do those fit into one character and how do those cohere in a way that I can make sense of it so I think non-dualism is helpful in spirituality because we hold those things in uh, tension same with spirituality with regards to spiritual encounters like we were saying earlier like the body and the mind are not separate but they're together and they're working together in this non-dualistic way to make sense of the world make sense of our experiences so that's really i hope a simple explanation in a long way yeah yeah no i would say that's a that's a great simple explanation um from my understanding of what i have learned from uh, the difference between uh, dualism and non-dualism in a spiritual sense is that really this non-dualistic uh, thinking is that there are these opposing sides between good and evil. 
and that there is no point to evil. Evil needs to absolutely die or evil, light and dark, whatever you want to call it, just uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll just say good and evil, um, that evil needs to completely die and uh, the good is what will prevail and live on kind of thing. And from my understanding, what I've learned about it is it's like, you know, something, uh, uh, something that can be seen as evil is like uh, anger or aggression, where it's like, you know, actually anger and aggression, there's, there's uh, necessary elements to those that can be actually very uh, loving and, and can be very, you know, justice oriented or even mercy oriented. Like, you know, and uh, it's like a lot of people will uh, run from the darkness, um, but it's like those things are always inside of them. And until we bring them to light and expose them and accept them and embrace them, they're always going to be that darkness that it's like we're going to run and hide from. Um, and, or, or we're always going to be in that war or in that battle or in that fight within ourselves. But in a non-dualistic point of view, it's actually bringing those things to light and, uh, acknowledging that they're there and then seeing the beauty on how both these positive and negatives can bring us into this balance that is life. Because obviously if you go completely on the bad or negative side, then you're just, I don't know, an asshole. <laughs> but if you're on the good side, then, you know, you're, you can be a pushover. And so it's like when you're right in the middle, it's like you're fully embracing all of these aspects of what's within yourself and being human. And so this having, in my understanding of it, it's, it was like having this non-dualistic type of thinking was not fully embracing every part of who, who you are. And it's, it's, it's not a bad thing somebody uh, I think I was listening to a podcast that, where they were talking about non-dualism in respects to God. It was like so many people think about God as the positive in dualistic thinking, but actually God is above that, that polarity. Like he's, he's over control of, of both of it. So that's, that's, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, but that's, that's how I've come to learn it and understand it. And you can correct me if I'm wrong in what I'm saying too. So. No, no, I think that's great. Uh, I think the non-dualistic understanding, like you can even look at the cross as a great example of that. Um, the cross is this horrific evil and violence, etc. But on the other hand, in the Christian tradition, it's also seen as like the saving life-giving event. And those are held in tension and they exist together and they're not one over the other, jettisoning one side while keeping the other. Rather, yeah. they're together in attention in this non-dualistic way. Yeah. Um, so I think that in spirituality, it's helpful, as you're saying, like with a God concept, just choosing the good. Well, anytime we have good, we're going to create an opposing evil. And that good is always subjectively constructed. So what I perceive as good isn't always good. It can be good from my perspective, but then as I get more complexity or I have another point of view, my good is actually the evil. And so we have these conflicting things within our own interpretation. So like my group perceived as being the good group, perceived by another group is actually the evil group. You can, especially in national uh, like wars and things like that or empires, whoever th is the good victor ends up writing it as they're the good victor, but ultimately they were perceived as the evil tyrant on the other end and the other ends thought they were the good victors that were trying to survive or fight back. So it's always a manner of like going back to interpretation and yeah. how we perceive things. So yeah. I think the non-dualism helps with recognizing that fact and not saying like, well then let's just get rid of it, but it has its place and its function and its use sure. and it's for its context specific um, particular happening or event that you're trying to work through. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And I, I like uh, the perspective that you have, cause I hadn't even thought about that before. Cause obviously when I, for, now that I've been like looking more into a non dualistic point of view, um, I haven't even thought about the benefits of uh, dualism and that it's like, Oh yeah, I wouldn't even have, I wouldn't even be able to have a concept of non dualism if I didn't understand, you know, dualism and that what is light and dark, you know, go into that universal law of polarity. And it's like, you know, what is good and bad, but also, 
you know, I like what you're saying, holding intention, just like, you know, Jesus on the cross, that being, you know, that, that, that it's, sh it's showing both how incredibly violent and exposing how violent the human race can be and also exposing, you know, a, a, a salvation and a, a savior's point of view. Um, so in regard to, um, well, I guess you already talked about, you know, how, how it's beneficial, how both sides are beneficial. Um, but I don't know, is there, is there any other thoughts that you have on a non-dualistic point of view that even you have that, that, that's really shaped and changed you and benefited you? Yeah, I think the biggest one for me is looking at the Apostle Paul's conversion. Um, because the Apostle Paul, he'll write in Philippians, like, I was, I'm the Hebrew of the Hebrew. I was perfect when it came to the law, law, carrying it out. Like I'm blameless. I did everything right in this religion. Like I was the best. And like, obviously like it's maybe way overstated, but he's saying like, I followed the instructions. I did everything right. I was faithful within the system that I thought I was being faithful in. And what did it do? It led me to persecute the people that I'm now a part of. I was so good at what I was doing, I said, I'm going to take this to an extreme and be so faithful to God that I'm going to go out, find these Christians, round them up, put them in jail, or see them killed off and gotten like completely rid of. And then he has this encounter with the Christ who says, why are you persecuting me? And so in that moment, he's confronted with the fact that Jesus, who is this one who's risen from the grave that's confronting him, is on the side of the victims whom he's persecuting. So in Paul thinking he's being faithful to the law and being good, being a good Jew following the law in his conception and persecuting these Christians, realize he's actually on the opposite side of the law and the opposite side of Christ because he's violently attacking these Christians. So he has his whole worldview changed and he goes from, he had a dualistic view. I'm on the good side. These are bad. I will get rid of the bad. And then it finds out that God's on the side of his perceived bad, which overturns his entire system of thought. And he has to reformulate, well, if God's on the side of the victims, what does this mean? I, like, I can't be violent anymore. I can't persecute people. God's on the side of all of humanity and especially on the side of those who are being persecuted. So I think in seeing his conversion and then him having to go from this well-trained scholar in the literature, in the religious traditions, having this encounter and then having to go back in a sense, he deconstructed and had to reconstruct in light of his experience of recognizing that this isn't just a good and bad thing. This is a good, bad medium in between all of these tensions that we have to hold together and having to reconstruct after that. I think that's been a, his path in that little journey has helped me understand my own journey of saying, I did, I was zealous. I was like, I'm going to be the best Christian there ever was. I'll have all these experiences. I'll race to the top. I'll do everything that I perceive to be good. And then I find out everything I was doing has horrible ramifications in some sense. And it's damaging to the world. It's damaging to other people. It's dehumanizing. It's demonizing and recognizing that, oh, I have to change. Like, God isn't on my side. God is on the side of those that I've been harming and doing damage to. So it's in that sense, that's been a helpful metaphor, his journey for my own process and journey. And seeing that even this person that we hold in high esteem in the Christian tradition was doing heinous, was basically a terrorist that was invited into the community even after all of that and changed in a transformative radical way. And that's been like hopeful and helpful to always like reflect on. I don't want to become so dogmatic that I'm creating harm and violence in whether it's psychological violence, violence, physical violence, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know that this is a, uh, yeah, let, we could, so this won't be our only podcast. <laughs> So I'm sure we could go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, but in regards to dualism and non-dualism, I want to briefly, if we can even make this brief, uh, bring up the entire concept of like, just like, you know, dualism and what you're talking about, the battling between good and evil and seeing good and evil. Okay. Yeah. Even my good can be somebody else's evil and just, rec you know, seeing that and recognizing that. 
But in regards to a, a, higher, uh, a higher thought of God and the devil. So people, people always look at this dualistic thinking. They're like, there's God and there's a devil. And, you know, actually, when you go back and look at scriptures, you see that the devil is not this character, but it's actually translated as the Satan instead of Satan. It's an actual frame of consciousness or whatever that might be. Um, and so in regard to, uh, you know, and I'm sure you could talk about this a lot more cause I'm just like, I'm starting to investigate it and learn about it. Um, but it's an interesting concept that I don't, I don't think people think about in regard to God being a very non-dualistic God, uh, even in theological like scriptures and just the interpretation of it has been and created these two characters where it's actually like, there's this one character that can like, uh, be the Satan or, you know, God in a sense. And like some people are, you know, obviously they hear that and they're like, no, absolutely not. There is a devil, there is hell, you know, and people are going to go there and the devil's going to torture people. Um, but it all has to go back to that uh, dualistic type thinking. So uh, just wanting to hear your, your brief thoughts on, non-dualism in regard to the aspect of God and Satan or the Satan. I know that you could probably go on and on and we could probably go on and on about it, but just, uh, you know, yeah, just what are your thoughts about that? Uh, and, and sharing, you know, the, <laughs> the, even the biblical truth of what the Bible even says about that. Yeah. Okay. So brief, that's going to be hard. Okay. Okay. So think, forget, forget brief, forget brief. Just go, just go with it. Just, just I'll do it as it. brief as I can, or I'll just, <laughs> I'll just keep talking. All right. Uh, yeah. Cool. I think so. Yes, there's with any concept, there's a history of the concept and a development of it, especially with a character like Satan or so in the Greek it's Hasatan. There's the article in front of it every time except i believe one time in the scriptures i may be wrong maybe two um but it's always framed as this the satan it translates like accuser or um like it's there's this parallel between the comforter the holy spirit as like the defense attorney and then the satan as the accuser in this like um judicial framework so that's one way of thinking of it it's like this other entity or principle um, Paul talks about like the principalities and powers and the rulers of the air. And it's these powers or systems that are over top of people. So like sin is a power, death is a power, the Satan is a power and they're influencing humans. They're influencing human desire or the things that they're doing. So with regards to Satan as a like personal figure, there's scholarship that talks about, during that period of time, the Satan probably was thought about um, as a personal figure, maybe even by Jesus himself or his followers and the Jewish tradition around that period of time. So it's not necessarily a uh, either or, but a both and. So like now that we, the things that we know today, we can look back and see the development of this figure and know that this isn't like a real thing. Like there isn't this Satan devil dressed up with horns and things running around. That's really the popularized version of it. But rather, um, Walter Wink is an incredible scholar who wrote a short book that's a culmination of three larger books from the Powers Trilogy. And the book is The Powers That Be. And in that, he talks about the way that the Satan and the powers and the principalities, all these are... Um, systems or institutions and then it gets down to the individual level and how we can understand it theologically today but if you go back to the hebrew scriptures the satan was in the court with god in heaven and you have this movement where uh, specifically in job where satan comes up to god and asking let me test your faithful servant job and so there's this interactive piece where it's configured that Satan is this figure that is in the courts of God. So in our sense, it'd be the, the evil principle itself, the very embodiment of evil is just in the courts of God, chit-chatting with God. And that can really screw up your theology. Um, and then you have a development where in the mythology or the theological interpretation around it, 
the devil is sent down to earth and is then amongst the people and the demons are in, all around the earth and they're trying to woo people away from God and getting people to be unrighteous, etc. And that develops into that tradition of like the early Christian period where there's the devils, the, the demons and the devil and this whole host of um, mythology around it a good place to start looking is you can start reading through like some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and recognize that there's this huge mythology that develops where demons have names and there's tons of angels with names and there are these opposing powers and it really is this dualistic construction of good versus evil on the earthly plane and then in the heavenly plane. And so there's this war that breaks out and they're all fighting each other. Um, so they're in that period, it was just common, uh, you could say like common knowledge that there's demons, there's angels, and we're all in this huge mix of both the natural world and this heavenly world, and they're kind of paralleling each other. And so what we do on the earth affects what happens in heaven, and what, ha what happens in heaven affects what happens on earth. And all of that, there's speculation. One place that, it point, that scholars point to is that when the temple was destroyed and the uh, Israel or Israelites were sent to Babylon, that Zoroasterism, this belief system by Zoroaster, was prevalent in the Persian society. And that was a highly dualistic system, that there was an opposing evil entity to the good entity. And so some scholars see that as a point where the, the dualistic thought entered into uh, Judaism as it was developing. And then it was taken up and developed in its own way hmm. there isn't you can't really say that's true or false in the sense of we can point to that as definitive evidence but there is something in the air at that time when this dualism was entering in whether it's from outside sources or just developed internally and i think in light of the development of the satan we can see that it isn't this entity that is influencing us but rather a more helpful way of looking at it is it's this principle or this power that is functioning to create discord or accuse people and is coming between people. And it's not this singular person that's been popularized by Hollywood and Dante's Inferno and things like that. And you get that linked up with concepts of hell that have been popularized in, especially in medieval theology and things like that. So there's definitely a history to the Satan. Um, for me, it functions more within a system of like, let's look at this anthropologically and how humans create discord between each other. We get into rivalries and conflicts and the Satan for me is this power or functioning of desire that goes towards this negative end where two groups are desiring the same thing and there's conflict that ensues. You could point that out theologically and say that's like the satanic principle that drives us together, creates conflict. There's a whole bunch of interpretations of the Satan. Some have done like psychological interpretations where Jesus in the desert being tempted by Satan is all of this psychological turmoil that he's undergoing. And the satanic principle is this like uh, fictive thing in his mind that is trying to coerce him to go away from the way that he's supposed to live out his life. And so each temptation that he faces ends up being something he faces later on in those gospel texts. And so it's him prefiguring that, what do I need to think through in order that I don't make bad decisions later on? So a lot of different interpretations, but the text themselves, like you have the accuser or the Satan, it changes depending. So it's never just this entity, Satan, but rather the Satan. That's a short history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you... Um... I mean, I guess you kind of already said it, but well, I guess a gr a good question would be uh, not a good question would be, do you think the power that is the Satan is God? Is it like a negative side of God? Like it's a, it's a equal, but a negative, or is it a power that God controls in a sense or has power over or that he uses um how do you how do you see that working in that way yeah i think that it's definitely not an equal party um it's a lesser party if anything because 
to put them on equal playing field just doesn't make sense within Christian theology because we confess that Jesus defeated death and the devil and sin and the flesh and everything and rose from the dead and conquered all of that. So if it is anything, it's a defeated power and is something that should be overcome in our lives. So I think it is just something for me, I do it from an anthropological perspective and then pull from the work of Rene Girard in mimetic theory in order to understand it, which is a whole nother conversation, but that's how I conceive of it. I think of it as this accusing principle that creates discord between people and is, it takes shape in the powers of institutions or in groups and functions kind of like a, uh, you could say like an archetype for this uh, image below. So it's prefiguring a group and it can function in different ways and can make people do things um, using like systems theory to look at this group of people in this institution are a system and this system can be described as like the satanic principle because of the negative ramifications and effects that are occurring. Um, but that's just a way to feel a lot, uh, to look at it theologically. I don't think that it deals with all the complexity because I think it still works within that dualism and saying that this particular system functions this way doesn't account for all the complexity of the people within it and things like that. Mm. But it is helpful to name things as this is a satanic power. This is legitimately causing harm and damage in the world. And it's something that has been overcome and we need to confront this. We need to call it out. So that's something that I more of deal with in the text itself and don't have within my own lived experience of, oh, that's the Satan or that's satanic because it just doesn't fit for the way I view the world now and what I understand of how humans exist and understand the world and the way we work together in systems and things like that. So it's more of just a theological or exegetical thing that I have to deal with. So do you um, see it as a person, a being, or it is just a power or an idea? Um, how do you, I mean, you've, you've talked about kind of how you personally see it, but in regards to it being an actual being, um, would you say the Satan uh, is a character? is a being or it is not. And it is just a, a, a power, uh, you know, and I guess some people would even say, well, if it's a power, then it is a character. It is a, it is a being. Um, so what, but what, what do you think uh, more, more directly? Is it, is it a character? Is it not a character? It's just, it, but it is this other thing. Yeah. So I'd say it's not a character. I don't think it has its own, like, consciousness or will or embodiment or anything like that, supernatural or otherwise, I think it more functions. So the article, the Satan, it functions as a thing or a place or a space, whatever you want to say, but more as that power or that influence, um, a principle of accusation and discord and murder and things like that. Um, mm. You have that passage in the gospel of John that talks about like, uh, a horrible anti anti-semitic passage but you, you like you are you are of your father the devil for he has been a murderer since the beginning and so it points to the devil functioning as this principle or entity behind murder and violence and it's been throughout this whole history and that's where more of i see it as connected to this centrality of violence and murder and discord and accusation but it's not a thing like a character, but a principal power type thing. Gotcha. So, I mean, so much information throughout just, just even that alone. And I'm, I'm sure we could sit here and deconstruct ideas of throughout religion and Christianity and thinking in a number of ways. And uh, me and Matt have already talked about, you know, more podcasts to come and, uh, so this is the first of many, um, but in regard to ev everything we just talked about um, in the deconstructing process, do you have any last thoughts, last last words for people um, <laughs> to wrap it all up? Hmm. Well, first, thanks for having me. I mean, this was great. I Absolutely. can't wait to do it again. Oh, yeah. Um, advice, I think I would just say that 
you know, you are the expert on your own experience in your life and you know what you need. Um, for some people, it may be, I need to deconstruct ideas. I need to read and study more. And there's a whole host of literature and podcasts and people doing good work that you can rely on and trust. Um, so I think if that is you, like, go for it. Um, yeah, there's great resources out there. Um, enjoy the process. Ultimately, don't get bogged down by the process. I think in a way to do that is to put like before your eyes, like what is the main thing out of this I'm trying to get? Like, am I just trying to deconstruct because I like don't want to do, like I don't believe this, so I'm just going to deconstruct for the sake of deconstructing, but rather go about it in a constructive way so that you don't go off into those places where it just becomes a destruction of everything and it's a horrible, horrible process but rather find ways to say, okay, I want to look at this. How can I do this constructively? And that's a process of doing research in a way that looking at the general overview and then diving down into specifics. So there's ways to avoid hard, painful fallout just by the manner of research, but I can't guarantee that it's not going to lead to total destruction, Yeah. but go for it. It's a blast. I love it just because there's something new around every corner. There's new ideas, different interpretations, and it really makes for a fruitful, fun existence. Just thinking about the deeper things and ways of being in the like ways of being in the world and ways of engaging God in the other. So that'd be my advice. Just go for it and be kind to yourself. Love yourself. Get out of the house. I need to tell myself that all the time. Don't just spend time reading 24-7. Um, and do it in community. That's another thing. Do it in community. Find people that you can journey with, ask questions with, because it's a lot more feasible in community than by yourself. Um, speaking from personal experience. Yeah, yeah. I would I would 100% agree with that. And I tell everybody at the end of my, most most of the time at the end of my podcast that it's like, um, all of this research is great, but if you don't go out and live it, if you don't go out and do it, if you don't go out and like, you know, apply it to your daily life and see that it actually works, then, you know, all of this is for nothing. Um, you know, and that's what I love about, you know, pragmatic thinking and, and pragmatic philosophy. When you study not just about pragmatic, what, what that word has evolved to mean, but actually the, the philosophy of pragmatism is to question things with a more of a scientific method kind of thinking where it's like, let's go out and see if this actually works and then come back and talk about it as a group. So, I mean, I think that's so incredibly important. That's such a great point to bring up is that, uh, yeah, to question, but to see if it works and to, you know, do all that. So Matt, thank you so much for your wisdom and uh, all that you have shared. It is absolutely incredible. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, so that is, that's today's podcast. If you stuck around for the two and a half, <laughs> it's fantastic. I love it. Two and a half hours of conversation and many more conversation to come. Uh, thanks for sticking around this long. And um, yeah, go out and do it. Go out and be it. And uh, we will see you guys in the next one. So peace.